Kyle, thanks so much for joining Making Healthcare Work for You, Different Perspectives and Empowering Solutions. I'm Stephanie Fields, joined by my co-host, Dr. Apoorv Gupta, and today we're welcomed by Marvin Music, who is the co-founder and chief educator for Medicare School. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it's a privilege to be with you. Uh, looking forward to uh, spending some time talking about this huge, important topic of Medicare. It really is such an important topic because we often say everybody's going to become a patient at some point. And in this case, you know, hopefully you get to be Medicare age and then everybody is, you know, at some point going to be touched by this. And so with that, we'd love to know some of the things that you deal with. You have a background as a pastor. You did that for several decades and then moved into this. And I, that definitely has to help you when you're speaking to people, you know how to relate to them and help understand what some of their fears or concerns might be. So when you're dealing with people first coming to you about Medicare or you're creating your videos about Medicare, what are some of the things that, that pop into your head that you really want to make sure people know? Okay. Well, first off, we want to make sure that people go on Medicare at the right time. Uh, the majority of people are eligible for Medicare uh, when they're 65 years old, but they don't necessarily have to start Medicare at 65. In fact, if they're still working or their spouse is still working and they're covered by an employer provided plan that has 20 employees, that's the key. It's got to be 20 employees at the company or more. Uh, they don't actually have to do anything at all with Medicare. Uh, they don't have to take Medicare A, they don't have to take Medicare B, and they will not be penalized. They can pick up Medicare uh, in the future when they retire. So that's the first thing. Be sure to go on Medicare uh, at the right time. Now, the reason that I emphasize not uh, doing anything with Medicare if you're still working is because many people have health savings accounts. They're called HSAs, and they contribute uh, to those. In fact, this year, people can put as much as $430 a month into an HSA, and all that money goes in uh, a tax uh, deductible, uh, and it's tax exempt if they use that for medical expenses any time in their life. So we think uh, HSAs are wonderful. Uh, but if someone enrolls in a Medicare A only or they enrolled in A and B, they can no longer put new money into the HSA. So that is really the first thing we look at. Be sure to go on Medicare at the right time. Don't go on too early. Certainly don't go on uh, uh, too late either. And so then once they've made that decision, then they're going to look at how are they going to use their uh, their Medicare benefits. I presume, Marvin, if you're deferring the decision to go to Medicare at a at a global level, is that ultimately saving the government money? Is that Absolutely. like a long term strategy the government yeah. is trying to deploy? Absolutely. Yeah, and you're right. And that's why they make it so easy for people to come into Medicare uh, later. So if I work till I'm 68 years old and come into Medicare, Medicare gives us a special enrollment period to make that possible. No penalties. No problems. There's a little bit of uh, a verification of credible coverage, but it really is a very easy system because if I wait till I'm 68 because I keep working, the government's glad for that because they're not responsible for me. It's my group health plan that's still paying the bills. That's great. And and really, HSAs are great, too. So I love that you encourage people to do that because I'm not a, an expert on all financial products. But to my knowledge, it's one of the only ones or the only one that you put the money in tax free and you withdraw it tax free. Usually you're getting taxed on one end or the other. And then additionally, you can use that once you get to a certain age as an investment, um, just like you do a 401k. So that's another advantage of those. But when people are coming to you, what are some of the differences between using employer plans and then using Medicare in either way that they're using it? Sure, sure. Well, uh, there are some people that um, will continue to work and they'll go on Medicare. And the reason that happens is because their employer plan may not be uh, as attractive financially as what Medicare is. Uh, so the point is that if someone is still working or their spouse is and there's 20 or more uh, in the company, they don't have to go on Medicare, but they may want to. And so we encourage people, compare your Medicare option. Uh, look, compare Medicare premium, uh, the, the co-insurance, the deductibles, the, the medication coverage. Compare all those aspects of the group plan to uh, the Medicare option. And if it makes sense financially, then go on Medicare. Your, your employer actually has to let you go at 65. They're required to do that. Uh, I would say probably two out of three people that are Medicare eligible should probably stay on their group plan, but one out of every three, uh, they don't have real attractive group plans. The, the premiums are high. Helped a guy just recently. It was with a car dealership. He was paying $600 a month for a group plan. Uh, and Medicare is a much better value than that. And so he kept working. 
but he decided to take Medicare instead. So we just encourage people to make that comparison. Now, some people don't have a group plan option. Uh, they, you know, they're no longer working or their spouse is not there or retired. So they have to go on Medicare at 65. And then that group of people will have to decide now that I'm on Medicare, uh, what, what additional insurance do I want beyond a Medicare? Because only 10% only of the Medicare population actually has A and B only, just 10%. 90% uh, of all people are selecting some kind of additional insurance option, which is either a supplemental plan or a Medicare Advantage plan. And so those are the two systems for insurance. And so people have to decide what is going to work best for them. Why would they choose one of those, uh, Marvin? It, it'd be interesting to understand why they need supplemental or Advantage. Sure. Well, because if someone had A and B only, uh, the, the, the problem with that is the financial liability. Uh, because Medicare A and B, A, of course, is inpatient, B is outpatient, and all doctor services, uh, both of those systems have financial gaps, we call them, or, or, or liability, because Medicare only pays, and this is real important, they only pay for one thing 100%, and that is preventive services. That's it. <laughs> so anything that's non-preventive, there's always going to be a balance of the bill. And so there will be a balance on the, on the hospital side and a balance on the outpatient side. And the, the problem with that balance is it's unlimited. There's no stop loss limit with Medicare. It just keeps going and going and going. In fact, here's an interesting statistic. Uh, right now in our country, we have over $200 billion, billion dollars of medical debt on the books, unpaid bills to doctors, hospitals, and such. And so the second largest holder of the medical debt in our country is held by people that are Medicare eligible. That's incredible. Okay, who is that? It's those people that are either on Advantage plans that couldn't pay the max out of pocket, or they're on A and B only, and they're responsible for all those gaps. And so that's why people have got to get something in addition to just to A and B, because the financial liability is truly unlimited. Okay. So if people have a supplemental or an advantage, then you go into more of the traditional system with deductibles and max out of pocket, whereas with A and B, you don't? Yeah, well, because A and B, uh, it, it doesn't set a limit. A and B just continues on. So, uh, for example, it, it, on, the, on the B side of Medicare, the big liability is 20% coinsurance. So that means anytime I see a doctor, I'm responsible for a 20%. So if I have a serious illness, I have cancer, every time I see the oncologist or I go for chemotherapy or whatever, I'm going to be responsible for that 20% coinsurance. And um, you know, right now with the average lung cancer, I think costs about $150,000 for surgery. So if I had A and B only, that doctor is a good portion of that bill. I'd, I'd be responsible for that 20% coinsurance to that doctor. And that's what I'm saying. It never stops. It just, it truly is unlimited. Uh, so, but I, now I can stop that and put a limit to it by getting a supplemental plan because those supplemental plans come in and then cover those financial gaps for me. Not fully today. They used to have plans that cover them fully, but we can we can get uh, everything covered by a gap plan today, but but one item, and that's called the Medicare B deductible. Uh, and uh, that's that the plan I'm talking about is called the plan G. 70% uh, of all people today going on Medicare supplemental plans buy a plan G and it's almost full coverage. So Medicare pays first and that G plan pays everything but a small deductible on an annual basis. So it's very, very comprehensive coverage. Okay. If someone takes an advantage plan that we you know discussed, Advantage plans, the way they work is they set a max out of pocket. So the max may be 10000 it may be 5000 but at least there's a limit to that. So if I have a $100,000 hospital bill, I'm not going to have to pay that. I'll just have to pay whatever my max is on that particular plan. So that's why I'm saying A and B only is not a good option financially. So most people should decide either supplemental or an Advantage plan, because at least my financial liability is going to stop somewhere. What do they have to factor in with prescription coverage? Because sure. that's a whole another can of worms. Exactly right. Totally different. Uh, the good news about prescription drug plans is they're they're drastically improving, especially from when I first started in the business 15 years ago. Uh, but the way that works is uh, drug plans are called Part D plans. And again, again, there's two systems. If someone has a supplemental plan, they have a separate drug plan. It's, it's called standalone. It's a separate policy. If someone has an Advantage plan, the, the Advantage company embeds or integrates, includes a drug plan as part of that package. 
And so when people are making their decision of how they're going to cover their inpatient and outpatient, then they're also making a decision about prescription drugs. And, it, and it's, a, it's a big issue today. But the government, because of this Inflationary Reduction Act uh, that passed in 2022 that began into effect in 2023, now we have a cap on how much people are going to be spending out of pocket for their medication. And it's wonderful. Uh, right now, this year, no one, regardless of the cost of their medications, uh, they could be on, um, you know, Eliquis or what, you know, some uh, very high dollar medication, but the max out of pocket this year is right about $3,350 for the whole year. Um, uh, uh, next year is going to be $2,000 cap. Uh, and so those really have drastically Im Im improved the last few years. It's, uh, it's so interesting to hear what you're saying, Marvin. I, I feel like you make it so easy to understand. And yet at the same time, there's still so many options. So I guess the question that's running through my head is, are most people able to figure this out on their own? Or do they need all the education that you're providing? Do they need the counsel of a broker? Uh, you know, or what, what's your experience there? Do, do you think the average Medicare eligible uh, patient is able to figure this out on their own? I, I think they intellectually could do it, but but they're thrust into this system at 65 or above. And uh, it, it can be very overwhelming because it is it is still uh, cumbersome. It's confusing because it's different from what they've been accustomed to. Uh, as we work, our employer pretty much makes the decisions. Here's the company we're going to choose. I'll give you three options, check the box, and we're done. With Medicare, it's not like that. They have to decide first, when am I going to go on Medicare? What's the process of doing that? Because we got to keep this in mind. When people go on Medicare, um, uh, if they're on Social Security already, they're automatically enrolled into Medicare. Uh, but if they're not on Social Security, they're not automatically enrolled, so they're going to have to go through that process as well. So once they've kind of jumped that hurdle of getting into Medicare, now we have all these insurance options. Uh, in fact, there's 4,000, almost 4,000 different Advantage plans in the U.S. today. The average consumer and the average market today will be exposed to 45 Advantage plans just in their zip code. 45. Uh, now we have 10 supplemental plan options and probably 20 companies in most markets that make those available. So that's really what adds to it. These two big systems of SUPS or Advantage and then all the different companies that offer them and the different letters. You know, Medicare, kind of the alphabet soup. There's 10 supplemental plans that are available. So the majority of people could understand it, but they usually have to make a decision within a couple months and they don't have time on their side. And so if they'll get somebody that will come alongside them and be unbiased and educate them first, not try to sell them something, but to educate them about their options, that's the best approach. And there's people like us, others out there who really are committed to making sure people understand how the system works uh, and what their options are so they can make the right decision. I would not go it alone if it were me. <laughs> How do you prepare for that? How do you, you know, you said that your journey to learning about this really was just, you know, going deep, trying to learn and make sure that you have the right information before you started working as a broker and educating people. So when people are preparing this, how early do you need to start? Should you, and regulations change so fast. So when you're 60, should you be starting to pay attention to this? Because, you know, it, it could take a while for you to really somebody who's not living in that world all the time, it's a lot to absorb. Yeah. Or is it, you know, do you need to start thinking of this with aging parents? Just what are the, the, the prep steps mm -hmm. to this world? Sure, sure. Well, uh, I would tell people probably if, if, I, if I am going to uh, be uh, no longer working at 65, I'd probably start looking uh, at maybe at 64 or six months before. But six months to a year is plenty because things do change. Legislation uh, has impact on Medicare. Uh, premiums change. Uh, companies do come and go. So I think that six months to a year would be wonderful timing. And then I would you know go, go to YouTube. We have a channel. Others that are out there like us that will teach you how this system works. Because if you'll take an hour or two just to uh, uh, watch and learn and absorb it, you'll say, oh, this does make sense. Because once people are in Medicare, the, the, usually the confusion is gone. It's just that initial entry point in. And so if they'll get an education, uh, read, well, again, again, YouTube's a great place to go today. Uh, and then um, I, I think some of the, the, the most dangerous advice 
can come from people who mean well, but they really have not uh, connected all the pieces of the Medicare puzzle together. And I mean, you know, uh, neighbors, uh, family members, they've made a, maybe made a decision for themselves, but they really don't fully understand how Medicare works. So sometimes they're very biased in, in what they have to share because they made a decision. Well, that may have been a good one for you, but it may be a lousy one for me. And that's what I tell people all the time. You're not your neighbor. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not your brother-in-law either. Uh, it may have worked great for them, but you take your own specific medications, the doctors you want to see, the things that are important to you, your health history, your risk uh, tolerance. There's all those things have to come into it. So make an individual decision, not copying what somebody else did, because that could be a huge mistake. Excellent. Wow. What a powerful message. I love that. And and I really love the uh, you keep underscoring it actually throughout you know, all of your answers that comes through that you're you really seek to educate first. I really love that message. And I think that ties back to your background as a pastor, uh, which you were explaining to us before. So if you don't mind maybe sharing with our audience again, what do you think that connection is? You don't do, you're not a pastor anymore, uh, but uh, I'd love to hear how you think that the, that work impacts the way in which you're able to help people today. Sure, sure. Well, um, uh, of course, pastors are teachers. In fact, that's what we would call ourselves, a pastor teacher. And so um, I did that for 20 years and um, uh, loved it immensely. And then, as I was telling you all, uh, before we uh, went live, um, uh, I was uh, helping plant a church, which means it was very small. Uh, and there were five families that wanted to start a church, and they asked me if I'd like to be involved and you know, serve as their pastor. Uh, certainly, five families couldn't support my family. I had five children at the time. I have seven now. Uh, we adopted two children from Uganda. Uh, but I, I, I had to find work, and uh, someone had suggested insurance, and I began to realize early on that people that were getting into Medicare were confused. They didn't understand you know, how the system worked, and so I wanted to understand it. Uh, and then after I began to, uh, you know, kind of connect the, the dots, uh, you know, across the, the T's and dot the I's, I began to realize, hey, this uh, needs to be taught first. Uh, yes, I sell insurance, but I don't start selling insurance. I start making sure people fully understand uh, what is happening. How is this going to work? No different than what a pastor would do when he preaches the Bible. We take a text and we we study it and then we explain what we believe the Bible is teaching. So I studied Medicare and I said, here's how this system works. And we wanted we wanted to remove the pressure and the biasness uh, from that decision because I know this, when people make a Medicare decision, they have to live with it because sometimes those decisions can never be reversed. And so I, it, has, it does have consequences for people physically and financially. And so we approach it from an ed education standpoint because people need the facts. They don't need to be sold anything. Uh, they need to understand what this decision entails, um, uh, what it's gonna look like if they get cancer, uh, what happens if they have heart disease, because I know that happens. Uh, in fact, I, this is real sad. Just had this happen. I had a gentleman come to me getting ready to retire. Literally one week before he retires, he found out he had pancreatic cancer. He and his wife came to me and I met with them to help them make this transition. And today he's deceased. He died within a couple months. It's so sad. And so I know that's a reality. People's health can change very quickly. And so when they make this insurance decision, it can't be because I'm making a decision because I'm healthy at 65. I take no medications. I say, I don't see you that way. I see you one day at 70 or 75 and probably not so healthy. And so let's make sure we're thinking the long term, not just the short term. I really appreciated, Marvin, your answer just now. And it, it kept me thinking about uh, the, the function that you're performing, I guess, both as a pastor and now as an insurance broker and educator, is that, is that it's a very personal thing. You're developing a relationship with people. Uh, they need to be able to trust you. There needs to be some transparency, communication. At least that's how it's coming across to me. At the same time, there's hundreds of thousands of people that are looking for this service. So I don't know if, all, if they're all able to find a quote-unquote trusted yeah, a broker like yourself. So, but I'd love to have have you comment a little bit on the relationship aspect of what you do and uh, whether people are able to find that you know relationship as they make their decisions. Sure, sure. Well, if people come to us or someone like us, uh, our our attitude is this: this is not what we call one and done, one and done. Uh, sometimes people in business um, they just want to you know make a quick buck, make a quick commission. And if that's all they they care about, that's that they shouldn't be in the business. Uh, I tell people, hey, I am now responsible for you for the, for really the rest of your life uh, because you're my client now. And so people have problems; things need to be changed. And so we come alongside them and provide that ongoing 
uh, customer support for them. And people need it. I mean, little things, bank accounts change. Uh, you know, people go through an issue where maybe their plan's not going to cover uh, their medication. So we're going to have to get uh, a preauthorization on that medication. Uh, so things like that happen. People need serviced. And so I would look for someone, if I were going on Medicare, that would be there not just to write a plan, but will be there in two or three or four or five years down the road uh, if I need if I need help. And so that's when, and, and there's a lot of people out there like that who really Really genuinely care about people. Uh, we make a living doing this, but we also have a great responsibility to deliver great service to people. So that's that's our goal. Not just to write the ink the app and write the write the policy, but to be there for them when when something comes up and things will come up. That really tag teams along with what I was going to say. I was going to ask a similar question for my kind of question. Why does this matter so much to you? Why is this so important? Because you clearly not only are passionate about doing what you do and like understanding it and helping people, but there's obviously something deeper about that, the process of helping people. Why does this matter to you on such a deep level? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a Bible verse. Okay. The Bible says, in fact, I think it was in Proverbs today, the righteous man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. And I try to live by that verse because yeah, I want to I want to I want to live out my belief system. I want to do what is right before God and before man. And I want my children to be blessed in that, you know, by being able to. Sorry. But by being able to have a godly father who sets a good example for them. And I try to do that in our company. I want to do that among my family. And so to me, it's not just making a living. It is making sure that I I, I, I live each day uh, in, in, in the right way. Not perfect for sure, okay? But I really strive to, to live with integrity uh, because I owe that to my children, you know, as an example. Hard to find a better mission than that. Yeah. Thank you so Sorry much for being that. here. That <laughs> was fantastic. We really Thank appreciate you. your time Thank and explaining you. this to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, my privilege. Thanks so much. And if I can ever help again, please let me know. Thank you for speaking with us so openly and vulnerably. Really appreciate what your, your last comments. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you all for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.